Good morning. Hope, you, hope you're home safe, warm, and comfortable. Uh, it's good to be able to be with you, even though I'm not with you. It's good to at least realize that we can study our Bibles together this morning, uh, despite this terrible weather and everything that's making that, uh, we're trying to make that impossible anyway. You might take your Bibles out and open them to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. We're going to spend almost all of our time this morning in Luke chapter 2, so you might want to open your Bible to that particular passage. I want to talk to, with you this morning about one of the most significant events in all of history. As a matter of fact, I was talking to someone this week about you know, what's the most important event that's ever taken place. Is it the birth of Christ, the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, or the ascension of Christ? And of course, we, we could look forward to the, the coming again of Christ, couldn't we? But we'll, we'll leave that one for another, another day. Joe, so as we were talking about that, which one of those is the most important? I have no idea how to answer that question. I really think that if you look at it from a biblical perspective, that you're looking at the same prophetic day, if you will. In other words, each of those moments, each of those periods in the life of Christ represent uh, the entirety of God's plan or entire process that's taking place. And so I don't know that we can say one's more important than the other because each one of them depend on the others happening. For instance, the death of Christ doesn't mean much if he's not raised from the dead. But of course, you can't have Christ go to the cross and ultimately be raised from the dead if he's not first born of a virgin, born of Mary, as we're going to read about in Luke chapter 2. So take out your Bibles with me and let's read for just a moment from Luke chapter 2, beginning there in verse 1. Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. In the same region there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night, and an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. It's a beautiful passage, such a, such a wonderful passage for us to spend a little bit of time on, for us to think about and consider as we think about our Lord and our Savior and all that he has done for us and all that he's accomplished so that we can have hope in heaven. And you know, there's a lot of prophetic importance to this event, isn't there? As a matter of fact, I think in almost all of these, these texts that deal with the birth of Christ, Micah 5 and verse 2 is quoted or at least uh, alluded to. And, and so there's this obvious significance. But what's interesting to me is how little is actually said in Scripture about the event itself. I mean, you basically get seven verses here that deal with the birth of Jesus Christ. Twelve, if you want to talk about the shepherds. Matthew doesn't spend much more time. Mark really doesn't mention it at all, so forth and so on. And, you know, I was reading some commentaries, and they said, well, you know, this is Luke, and he's writing about a birth, and what do you expect a man to say about a baby being born? This is about what men say, right? As little as possible, the baby was born, it was healthy, everything's good. But you know, what's interesting to me is if you go back to Luke chapter 1, he makes a point that he's giving an eyewitness account of the things that he's speaking of. I don't think this is just a man's perspective of the birth of a baby. This seems to my mind to be what Mary told Luke about the birth. And, and I think there's something there. I think there's a, an intentional simplicity to the birth record of Jesus Christ. Because we spend just a little bit of time here in Luke chapter 2, we're going to notice some interesting things, some strange contrast. There's a lot here for us to see. And I, I want to begin by talking about one of those contrasts, and that's the contrast between two kings. 
the setting or the scene for the birth of Jesus Christ is set when a man who's named Augustus, or who named himself Augustus, as you'll find out, became Caesar and commanded his kingdom to be brought in for a census. King James says for taxation. By the way, no contradiction there. The idea of a census in ancient Rome was bringing everybody in, seeing how many people we have, what their businesses are, what their income is, so they can be taxed. And so here we have this man. By the way, he was the nephew of Julius. And he comes in and he's going to show everyone that he's the king, show everyone that he is the emperor. And so he's going to force them to leave their homes and go to a designated location and be counted so that he can make them pay taxes. I really think that what we have here is the idea of um, a man trying to demonstrate his own power. One man saying, I can compel all of you to bend to my will and to do what I wish. And he does that in, in a somewhat grand manner. But there's another king in the context, isn't there? And that's Jesus Christ, the Lord. And whereas we see Augustus, the nephew of Julius Caesar, he names himself Augustus, you know, a, a word that simply means important. Uh, and, and, and he shows his self-importance by commanding this census and this taxation and all the things that go with it. And then we see Jesus. You could not find yourself in more humble circumstances than Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 2. Now, if you do a little bit of research on this, you'll, you'll realize quickly that our concept of an end and the New, Con New Testament concept of an end is probably not the same thing. You and I hear that word end, we think something along the lines of a hotel. And, and so basically what we, you know, if we were to put this in modern terms, we kind of envision Jesus being born in the parking garage uh, of the local hotel. And, and you know, maybe that works. Uh, if you'll do a little bit of reading, he could have been anywhere from a friend's house to a cave. As a matter of fact, most of the early traditions would would show Jesus being born in a cave in which there was some straw or some hay laid down. It was just a place to kind of get out of the weather. Whatever your picture of this, however you see this, whatever really happened, I think we get the same idea. Extremely humble circumstances. The very last thing you would expect God to be in when he comes to the earth, when he comes and, and, and joins with his creation, and yet that's exactly what we see. The Lord of glory comes and joins his creation in the most unassuming manner possible. Again, think about the contrast. You've got Augustus here, and he's, he's doing something to show everybody how powerful he is. Is. And then you've got the creator of heaven and earth in a manger. Absolutely no outward demonstration of power. I do think one thing's interesting in this context, though. Augustus had to command everyone to come and to bow down to his power. He had to force them to do it. There's this show of force that's taking place. But you notice what happens, and it seems to be a very voluntary thing. There's no, no mention of a command but it's these angels, and they come, and they sing the praises of God. Verse 13, suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. What a contrast. This man who thinks he's something. Who, who feels the need to demonstrate his alleged power, and then God himself coming in this humble circumstance. Can I suggest we learn a few things from this? First of all, I think we should understand that true power is not found in these outward demonstrations. There was no need for Jesus Christ to come in an outward demonstration of power. He is God. He knew he was God. He knew that men would come to realize that he was God. And he knew that he could come and accomplish his purpose without some magnificent demonstration. When you think about Augustus, when you think about Caesar in this context, there's this seeming need that, that maybe all of us feel at some point to kind of wear power or control or authority as if it's some sort of garment 
But you know, that, that's not what power is. That's not what authority is. That's not what you know, control, if we want to use that word, truly is. Instead, when we behave in this way, we're, we're not showing that we're powerful. We're showing that we have a problem with pride. That we have a problem with arrogance. You know, I find oftentimes that, that men who act like Caesar Augustus acts in this passage are really, really insecure. The, the real problem they're having is dealing with their own um, self-image, their, their lack of security, and they're afraid, afraid that other men will see them as they see themselves. So when I look at God, when I look at Jesus, when I see how he came in the flesh and how he demonstrated the, these very same things, what I see is power as being the loving fulfillment of the responsibilities that come with authority. And, and whatever you know, power structure that we're talking about, whatever relationship that we're talking about, Jesus didn't come with fanfare. He didn't come with, with all the world standing still and acknowledging that the Son of God had entered into the created realm. He announced himself to a few shepherds. A little later on, some wise men are going to realize it. The angels are going to sing. But you know, if I'm reading this text right, the only people that seem to recognize that is the shepherds. And yet the Son of God came to be among his creation. I think we could do well to think about that. How do we view whatever power, authority we have in this world? How do we demonstrate that? Do we do that by kind of putting our thumb on top of people and, and, and sort of trying to force ourselves on them? Or do we just lovingly carry out the responsibilities that we have? Doing our best for others. Seeking to lift them up and empower them. I think that's the example that Jesus leaves for us. Well, let's move on because I think that something else we see here, and, and we're going to see this more in the Gospels, and you see this kind of opened up later on in the Gospels, but it, it begins from the very beginning, and, and I think there's something powerful about that, and, and that has to do with the welcoming nature of Jesus Christ. He's a welcoming king. You know, all throughout his ministry, there are people who are going to come to him and they're going to ask questions about the kingdom. Can I be in the kingdom? How can I be in the kingdom? You know, you might think about Nicodemus over in John chapter 3, and that's the question that Jesus answers. Nicodemus phrases the question having to do with eternal life, but either Jesus understood that that was kind of a metaphor for in the kingdom, or Jesus understood that what Nicodemus really wanted to know was how do I get in the kingdom? And, and you know, Jesus answers this question for him. He answers it for the rich young ruler, doesn't he? Matthew chapter 19. And there in verse 23. And I think what you'll realize is the predominant thought of the day was that only those of a certain class were really acceptable to be in the kingdom. I think this is Nicodemus' problem. When, when Jesus says, if you want to be in the kingdom of God, you must be born again. And, and I really think Nicodemus, I don't think he's being sarcastic or facetious. I, I think he's a little confused because here he is a leader of the Jews, a ruler of the Jews. And in his mind and in Jewish thought at that day, that's who was going to be in the kingdom. And so Nicodemus is kind of looking at himself and he's saying, I'm um, about a Jew, as Jewish as a Jew can be. I'm, I'm a leader of the Jews. Be born again as what? And of course, Jesus is talking about a spiritual rebirth, a, a humbling of self, a submitting of self to God, uh, kind of putting aside all these foolish notions about, uh, about being something special and instead recognizing that his job was to submit to God, that, that that's how we enter into the kingdom of heaven. It's kind of interesting to me in Luke chapter 2 who is first introduced to Jesus. And it's not someone that you would think of as being special or powerful or influential. Or, you know, if you were to look at a, group, a list of people and say, okay, if, if God came in the flesh, who would be the first people he'd introduce himself to? How many of you would raise your hand and go, probably the shepherds? Well, of course not. You know, we, we would think he would go and speak to those who we thought of as being important. And yet, you know, the first people we see Luke introduce or, or Jesus introduced to in the book of Luke are going to be these shepherds. And by the way, shepherds weren't exactly um, 
welcomed in Jewish society. They, they were looked at as kind of outsiders by this point in time in, in Jewish society, probably a little bit different in Old Testament times, but they didn't live in town. They, they, they kind of stayed on the outskirts. They were on the fringes. They didn't necessarily participate in, in everything that the traditional Jew would participate living in the city of Jerusalem or in a city like Bethlehem. They, they kind of stayed on the outside and they were viewed with a little bit of suspicion as a result. And, and so these, these would have been outsiders, the very group of people Jesus is going to go to, by the way, throughout his ministry. And we see that from the very beginning. And here they are, they're fresh in from the field. They, they've been out staying in the field. And, and, and the next thing you know, here they are, Standing before the Christ, the Son of God. You know, you might put your marker there in Luke chapter 2 and turn over to the book of Matthew with me because it's kind of interesting in Matthew who it is that's introduced to Jesus first, it, at least according to Matthew's telling of this particular story. Matthew chapter 2, there's going to be some men. We, we might talk about them as the wise men. I think the more appropriate way of looking at them is the Magi, uh, kind of an interesting group of people. If you want to go back and do some research on who these people were, um, they've been around for a while. They're Persians. They're from the East. They're, they're probably descendants of the same group of people that Daniel was a part of when he was in Babylon in the captivity. And here they are in Matthew chapter 2. And, and notice how they're described. Verse 1, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the East arrived in Jerusalem. These are not Jews. These are not Israelites. Magi from the East, probably from Persia. Where is he, verse 2, who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Now, a lot of commentaries kind of go crazy there, and they say these men are, are actually looking at the stars, and they're, they're drawing out star maps, and based on what they see, they've decided that it's a, a, a special season, a particular time, and, and, and they've used the astrology to find. I don't think that's at all what's going on here. Look at what Matthew actually says. They're talking to Herod. They think Herod might know who the Christ is or where he is. Instead, he's having to ask them questions about this Messiah. Where is he going to be born? Verse 5. They said to him, this is the Magi answering Herod. They said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Jews. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my, my people Israel. That's Micah 5 and verse 2. How did they know that Jesus was going to be born? They were reading the prophets. And they saw in the prophets that now was the time. And so they came looking for him and they were looking for the signs that the prophets talked about. And they knew. They knew that Jesus was there. But if you keep reading the text, they actually go to Jesus, right? They, they worship Jesus. Who is welcome into the kingdom? Well, in Matthew 2 and in Luke 2, it's shepherds and magi, shepherds and Gentiles, who come and bow down before Christ and are received by him. Maybe I'm stretching that a little bit. He was a baby, but you get the point that I'm making. They were received by the king as shepherds and magi. Who does Jesus welcome? Well, the answer is pretty obvious, isn't it? He welcomes all who seek him. He welcomes anyone who would come to him. He welcomes anyone who will do what the shepherds did and listen to the messengers sent by God and, and follow the instruction that they've been given. He welcomes anyone who would do what the Magi did, read the prophets, read the scriptures, hear the message that's delivered, and, and act upon it. You know, turn with me, if you will, over to Matthew chapter 11. Isn't this the point that Jesus makes over in Matthew chapter 11? You know, the, the great invitation of Christ. And, and if you go back and read all of Matthew chapter 11, this is really the idea that he's been getting across, is, is that you should be able to recognize the Christ as the Messiah based upon the works that he has done. And based upon that, you should listen to the gospel that he has delivered. And based upon that, you should repent. You should seek Jesus based upon the word of God. If you'll live obediently to that, 
and you'll be welcomed by the king. And so in verse 25, at that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this way was well-pleasing in your sight. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me who... All who were weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Who does Jesus the Christ welcome? All who will come to him. All who will hear his gospel and respond to its call are welcomed by the king. Brethren, that's about as encouraging a thing as I can think of. That regardless of my, my station in life, regardless of my situation, regardless of how I've lived up until this point, the God of heaven came to the earth and called us to him. And we can respond. And we can be part of his kingdom. Jesus Christ is a welcoming king. One last thing I want to I want to deal with this morning as we're talking and, and, and thinking about these things, and I think these are pretty important things. The birth of Jesus Christ and the way the birth is described, the story of the birth of Jesus Christ tells us a lot about the nature and the depth of the incarnation. And I want you to think with me about how other authors in, in other contexts Talk about the incarnation of Christ. You know, we could go over to Hebrews chapter 2. We've done that before. We'll probably do it again, Lord willing. And we could talk about the incarnation in Hebrews chapter 2. And what we would find as we're reading along in there is, is the incarnation is described in terms of suffering and death. As a matter of fact, that's exactly what we find out in verses 9 and 10, that Jesus was made a little bit lower of the angel, than the angels. Why? So that he could experience, so that he could taste the suffering of death. And if, if you keep reading Hebrews chapter 2, you, you find out that he's, he's made like his brethren. I believe that's verse 17 of Hebrews chapter 2. He was made like his brethren. If you, if you go back to like verse 13 and 14, you'll find out his brethren is us. He, he's, talking about, he's talking about humanity, specifically faithful humanity. He was made like his brethren in, in the fact that he suffered temptation, yet without sin, verse 18. And so the Hebrew writer, when he talks about the incarnation of Jesus Christ, speaks in terms of suffering, death, temptation, tasting or fully experiencing the human experience, what you and I experience. Go read Philippians chapter 2. Paul in Philippians chapter 2, as he talks so poignantly about the incarnation, he speaks in terms of humiliation, obedience and death humiliation obedience and death and i think both of these passages really have as their central focus the cross as kind of the the ultimate moment of the incarnation but you know what i find out in luke chapter 2 is there's a lot more to the incarnation than the cross and and the events surrounding immediately surrounding the cross and the death of Jesus Christ. What I find out in Luke chapter 2 is that the creator of the universe was willing to take on the limitations of an infant. Now go back over there to Luke chapter 2 with me and, and think about that for just a moment. It was kind of a, it, it's a beautiful picture that's described in Luke chapter 2. It's, it's, it's a picture that, that I think brings joy to all of our hearts, doesn't it? You know, it, it's just a special thing, isn't it, to see a, a mother holding a, a newborn child and, and, and cradling that child and, and holding it close to her and, 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 and just comforting and loving and caring for that child. It's, it's a beautiful thing for us to witness, and that's exactly what's described. And, you know, again, it, it's not a lot of words, but, boy, it paints a beautiful picture. Verse 6 of Luke chapter 2, while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. Listen to this. And she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger. She wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger. So the picture there is 
You know, it's not it's not putting the baby in the, the onesie that you bought to bring home from the hospital. That That's not the idea. But uh, it's the idea, and I've seen some of our mothers in, in, at church do this, where, where they'll take the baby and they'll take the blanket and they'll swaddle the baby. And, and you, you wrap the baby up really, really tight so it feels like it's being held and it feels comforted and it's it's safe and it's comfortable. That's the very picture that's being painted here of Mary and her interaction with Jesus. I, I don't know about you, but that, that to me is just a profound thing to think about. You know, I go over to John chapter 1, and I see Jesus introduced very differently. In the beginning was God, or in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then we find out in verse 2 and 3 that this word who is God, that he created everything that is made. And we know that word is Jesus. We get down to verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. That, that word, that, that Jesus that is the creator, is this Jesus who is an infant being swaddled by his mother. And you know, when, when you look at that picture, that baby wrapped tightly in his blanket, what do you see there? Well, you see love. You see care from the mother to the child. You see comfort from the mother to the child. All these important things. But that's not all, is it? You, you also see there the limitations of an infant. You, you see there the acceptance of, of weakness, at least for a moment. All that could happen to an infant. And here's the mother protecting the child from all of those things. Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, willingly, willingly took that on. You know, when I look in that manger in Luke chapter 2, what I see is the love of God. The love of God, the, the love of the Father to put this plan together and to enact this plan and to be willing to send His Son to carry this plan out. And, and that's a beautiful thing and that's a wonderful thing. But we also see the Son, don't we? In the vulnerability that He was willing to accept so that he could come and be our Savior. There was a baby in that manger who is the Christ. And that baby would grow, Luke chapter 2. He would grow and he would go out into the world and he would preach a gospel. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He would call people to him offering them the very thing that they needed more than anything else, forgiveness of their sin. And he would provide that for them so that they might have hope of life eternal with their Heavenly Father. I hope you'll think about Luke chapter 2. I hope you'll think about all that Jesus has done, all that he was willing to, to give up and, and to, to, to lay aside, if, if only for a time, so that we could have that hope. If you're listening to this this morning and there's sin in your life, I hope you'll do something about it. I know it's a, it's a difficult day. But friend, if you need to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, you let me know, we'll find a way. If you've done that and yet there's sin in your life, I hope you'll repent. I, I hope you'll think about that baby who came so that you could be saved. The man that he became as he died on a cross so that you could be saved. The resurrection that his father accomplished so that you could be saved. The fact that he ascended into heaven to be seated at the right hand of the throne of God to serve as your high priest so that you could be saved. If we can help you in any way, you let us know as soon as you can. We'll pray with you and for you so that you can be saved on that final day. Thank you so much for your time and for your attention. 
Um, we're going to try to have another online service tonight. Um, if I'm able to get that going and get that together, it'll be at our normal time, but I'll let you know via Remind. Um, stay safe, stay warm, uh, please be comfortable, uh, and, and spend some time today thinking about your God, thinking about all that He's given for you. Appreciate your attention very much.